experimental and computational. So but I mean, uh, she's here. Professor Kuroda uh -huh. is. दुल्हा इनका सुपरवाइजर कौन था किसके साथ इन्होंने की थी मुझे चैट बॉक्स में लिख दे I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you well as well. Good. Yeah, normally it's sunshine here in the morning, but um, we're having a big snowstorm today. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, like 24 hours of snow. Oh, goodness. Yeah. We How's your weather? Much, so we don't have much experience of snow because I don't think it has ever snowed in our city. Um, wow it is uh, one of the hottest uh, cities of uh, pakistan so we don't have any snow experience and right now it would be it would be summer anyway yeah so it's still winter but uh, the weather has started to get a bit warmer like slightly so we have sunshines in the day the nights mm -hmm. get a bit uh, colder but uh, gradually the temperature is getting better and better so how's the covid situation there oh very bad <laughs> terrible just awful how about you so, so i think we are at the uh, towards the end of the second wave but so so did, did, were you guys able to continue the research during all those times of um, so, so first we stopped for three months, we stopped completely. And then um, we started again, but at a low density of people. Oh, okay. And um, everyone has to wear a mask all the time at work. Yeah. And they have to have basically their own space. So you're not supposed to hang around with anyone close. Okay. So it's been difficult. So it was closed for three months, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you guys protect the fly stocks? So we had, you know, essential personnel had to come in there. Um, okay. So, so it, it was same for us, uh, just that we had to close for six months. And uh, oh. so Najma and Jawad are here. They used to come to flip the flies, even in the strict uh, lockdowns. And once yeah. they also uh, got uh, fined by the police for... Uh, being there in the lockdown, but they had to come because the flies needed someone for it. Yeah. I know, we were thinking, what can we do at home? Should we bring everything home? You know, it just it would be crazy. But yeah. Uh, yeah, these are tough times. Is this most of your lab, Dr. Tariq's lab? Hello, uh, it's Tariq here. So Hi. nice to see you and thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, it's towards the evening and uh, we realize we have a clashing uh, junior lab going on. So quite a few of people are in the lab uh, teaching, you know, the mm. cell and molecular biology module there, but they will be soon joining us. Uh, but most of my lab are people are there. We have a guest here as well uh, from Mexico. We got uh, email today. He wanted to join. So Hector is actually from Mexico, Hector Montiel. Uh, so today oh, in my yeah. yeah so in my opinion we are a relatively less number of people at the moment but they keep joining as we move on yeah that that's fine i actually wasn't sure if it, most people would be familiar with chromatin i'm hoping so um they all are familiar with the chromatin yeah. rather 
Uh, two people, uh, Abdullah was talking about Najma and Jawad. Uh, they just flew to USA two days ago. Jawad, uh, who was on the Enoch paper. Uh, okay. Recently, I think he, he interacted with you on Amble meeting as well. So Jawad mm-hmm. has joined, joined uh, Northwestern for postdoc. And Najma is towards finishing her PhD. So uh, wife of Jawad, they both have uh, just landed in US, I think, hardly 40 hours ago. Did, did, and go to, with did he go to the Ali Shalatafard's lab? No, in uh, Jindan U, or maybe I'm not pronouncing correctly. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I asked Najma to, to join Ali's lab <laughs> as postdoc if she wants. I think she will once she finishes her thesis in, I think, a few months, two, three months mm-hmm. from now, or a couple of more months from now. And you, you trained in the U.S. or in Europe? No, I got training in uh, FMI, Basel, Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Uh, my PhD was with uh, Jerzy Pashkowski. We, he was one of the earlier guys in epigenetics and Arabidopsis. So I published, uh, you know, DNA methylation, uh, directing histone H3 lies in 9 methylation, which was a big storm of that time, and we were mm. beaten up every time. Uh, and also I worked on, you know, where the cell cycle is important for reversing the epigenetic states. So after my PhD, I uh, did want to, uh, want to go to US, but my wife was doing PhD there in Basel. So I opted to stay within Europe and I joined Renato Paro's lab. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was, I was quite certain that I wanted to change model system and fly was my choice uh, during my postdoc. So I was lucky to, to be with Renato for like next five months, uh, five years. So I worked on uh, HSP 90 and Trithorex connection. Mm-hmm. And uh, Renato then moved as a director of Institute of Systems Biology in 2006 in Basel. From Germany, he came to Basel, the place where I was trained as PhD. So I left ETH Zurich in 2009 uh, and joined here at Lahore University of Management Sciences which uh, started a very bold experiment, which we call interdisciplinary school of science and engineering, where we have electrical engineering, computer science, maths, uh, chemistry, biology, and physics. And uh, the students get first year training in all fundamental sciences, uh, regardless of whichever major they are going to opt for in the second year. So it it was basically modeled after Caltech, I remember. Uh, our founding team was from Caltech and UC Berkeley. And all our advisory board, we had a very strong advisory board from MIT, Stanford, uh, uh, people from industry and academia. I think three days ago, we we, uh, finished our advisory board for 2021. So in the beginning, it was an experiment. And uh, now it's, it's a little baby, which is walking. Uh, taking sli- uh, small steps. We had just BS program in the beginning, BS in biology in my department. So I was the founding chair of this department. And uh, I did all the recruitment and you know curriculum and everything. And one experiment we did early on was to bring in computational biology as part of uh, core cell and molecular biology. Uh, because coming from uh, ETH, I, I, I could see that biology is going quantitative. If we want to uh, understand things at systems level, we cannot run away from computational biology. So we brought in ComBio courses as part of cell and molecular biology courses and also recruited faculty uh, who are experts in computer science or stats. And uh, they are the ones who have independent research groups. They have their own groups. One works on genome, genomic, uh, genome evolution in wheat and uh, also worked on uh, ripening genes in mango. And other one, Dr. Safiullah Chaudhary, he works on uh, proteomics. He works on basically uh, systems biology of cancer. And he has developed a couple of uh, gene networks, which he's trying to analyze uh, their role in, in oncogenesis. So we recently had a very good meeting with Mike Levine. You may know him. Mike is at Terps. And we are a small group of people, hardly, I think, nine faculty members in this department. 
but it's it's going so far good because in 2013 we started master's program followed by phd as well within the same year and uh, this uh, last year 2020 first batch of phd's which were just five they graduated with phd from uh, our department and three of them are already in us for postdocs great that's quite an achievement thanks we thanks miss, for compliment we do miss renato now i guess he's really retired yeah uh, renato retired uh, 2019, uh, I couldn't go to his retirement symposium because uh, I, I just came back uh, from Cambridge. I remember attending a meeting there. And uh, yeah, Renato is still uh, Professor Emeritus there mm -hmm. at ETH. But of course, I think he's no more going to um, big meetings and yeah. So I think at six or five, uh, many people have joined. Let me introduce and uh, then let's start. So it's a real pleasure uh, to have uh, Professor Dr. Mitzi Koroda with us. Um, Mitzi Koroda studied biology at Tulane University in 1981. And she did her PhD from Stanford University in 1987 followed by postdoc also from Stanford in 1990. Uh, she started as assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine in 1990. And uh, since 2003, she has been the professor of genetics and medicine at the Harvard Med School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, her lab analyzes potentially bivalent uh, complexes of polycomb repression complex one with MOS uh, and related co-activators in embryonic stem cells and uh, aberrant properties of oncogenic MOS and MLL in leukemia. From 2000 to 2004, she has been elected, elected member of the board of directors of Genetics Society of America. She has also been a member of the NIH Molecular Genetics uh, B study section. And Professor Kuroda has also been awarded the NIH Merit uh, Award. And she is also an elected member of National Academy of Sciences, which is a dream of many biologists around the world. So it's a real player, uh, Professor Kuroda, to have you. And she'll be talking about bivalent polycom complexes of master switches of developmental gene regulation. Thank you for joining us. Over to you. Okay, I'll try to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, how does that look? It looks perfect. All right. I have some people. Let me get my picture out of the way here. Oops. I guess I can't do it. Oh, well. Okay. So, um, thank you so much for that in introduction and for the kind invitation to speak to you guys today. And it is one of the uh, few pleasures of this era that we now are speaking internationally to people that we maybe could, could not necessarily visit in person. So, um, I think Dr. Tariq already introduced my topic. I'm going to talk about um, regulation of developmental genes, uh, primarily in Drosophila today. And I'm going to start really with the broad view, which is the central question in biology, which uh, many of us study, which is how do you start with one genome, the pluripotent cell, and um, go from that to a complex multicellular organism? And um, I think there's wide agreement that a very large component of this is the cell type specific transcription of that genome. So how is it that it can be utilized in so many different ways, but so really precisely? And um, so, you know, starting from the very simplistic idea 
we, uh, I think there's general agreement that this occurs through the regulation by combinations of transcription factors. So these are sequence specific uh, DNA binding factors. And in a very simplistic view, there are um, activators and repressors. And um, one could have imagined a long time ago, maybe that there would be dedicated activators for each kind of cell, but now it's clear there's way too many cells and not enough transcription factors for that. And it's clear from work, say in the pluripotent cell um, IPS um, field that groups of transcription factors can direct different kinds of cell transcriptional programs. But I wanna just emphasize that we really aren't close to explaining specificity looking at the DNA sequence of a genome because there's a vast, vast excess of these DNA motifs for these um, transcription factors. There's a vast excess of binding without apparent function if you map the binding of these factors to the genome. And in fact, the regulatory sequences that regulate genes, especially in uh, mammalian cells can be really quite distant from target genes. So I'm not gonna talk about uh, this today, but the recent progress in that aspect, I think is very exciting in that we now know that the genome isn't just one large uh, compartment that can be accessed uh, by all factors, but in fact, that the genome is divided into so-called topological associated domains. So that within these say megabase regions, that, um, that uh, there's a more of a likelihood of uh, a regulatory sequence accessing a gene than uh, across one of the borders. So that in essence, this kind of conserved compartmentalization helps um, us understand the regulatory problem. And then of course, you know, the subject of this talk today is chromatin. And um, I think you're mostly acquainted with this, which is that the genome of course is not a naked DNA, but it's decorated with nucleosomes. The nucleosomes are different depending on what post-translational modifications, et cetera. So, uh, so it's clear that the, the chromatin has a role in the cell type specificity. And um, for example, it restricts the genome into expressed, potentially expressed or the silent state. Um, it has a self-reinforcing memory of prior expression. So they're readers and writers of post-translational modification. Let me stop for a second. Um, I need to get my picture, rid of my picture, there we go. Um, self-reinforcing memory of prior expression state through readers and writers of these post-translational modifications. May, may I suggest you? So yes. if you go where, where pictures are coming, there must be three, four on top when you bring your uh, cursor there, you click on the one which is a bit thick line. And I think your picture will become single there. Yeah, I got, rid of my, I got rid of my picture completely. So, okay. although then now I can't see you either. So if for some reason something goes wrong, You'll have to shout at me. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Occasionally something strange can happen in Zoom meetings, so we'll see. Um, so yeah, so these modifications, um, and uh, you know, I think we agree that regulatory decisions because of chromatin do not need to be remade every time a cell divides, which is, um, you know, very helpful in terms of uh, keeping things. Uh, with uh, having a cell type have fidelity and not be, be changed because it requires, you know, transcription factors precisely expressed every cell division. So the focus of my talk today then is that are the trithorax and polycomb group proteins. And these of course were discovered in Drosophila because they regulate the Hox genes. All of this is very conserved in terms of pattern, body patterning. And, um, but it turns out that they don't just regula regulate the body pattern through Hox genes, but they really, really regulate these transcriptional, um, the cell type specific specificity in general. So they basically, for developmental genes, they mark the active and silent state. And um, so trithorax proteins, let's see, does this work? Yeah, um, are associated with this active chromatin mark histone H3, K4, trimethyl, uh, whereas the polycomb group is associated with the silent mark, H3, K27, trimethyl. And this is, again, highly conserved in all uh, multicellular uh, organisms. And the interesting thing is that these are um, ubiquitously expressed proteins. So 
And yet their genome binding patterns are cell type specific. So in any given cell, a gene might be marked with trithorax, whereas in a different kind of cell, that same gene would be marked with polycomb. So trying to understand how this happens uh, has been, you know, occupied the field for quite a number of years. And given what I told you about transcription factors, the question kind of boils down to how are the trans trithorax and polycomb group directed by those combinations of transcription factors that truly determine the cell type. So the classical model is, um, and really quite uh, supported by genetics, was that the re recruitment of tr uh, trithorax and polycomb would occur um, once activators and repressors had determined whether a gene would be off or on. So subsequent to that, there would be some kind of interactions with tr trithorax proteins with these activators or and polycomb would be attracted by repressors and the, with the end result being a stable activation or repression. Uh, but what this requires is a distinct protein-protein interactions at each gene and each cell type. And as I told you, in a different cell type, a gene might be active or repressed. So, um, so in terms of biochemistry, it was a very complicated scenario and act in actuality, not a lot of direct evidence. So in my lab, we wanted to look at this in a, uh, in a new way um, because we had started using cross-linking affinity purification to look at protein-protein interactions. And so the idea was, well, maybe this, these interactions here had not been discovered because um, they were transient or labile or difficult to purify, but with cross-linking, this gave us a new tool. So we call this method BioTap XL, and um, uh, as I said, it's based on how one purifies chromatin by formaldehyde crosslinking. Uh, but in in addition to purifying uh, chromatin through an affinity tag and getting the DNA sequences that complexes are bound to, we could also instead isolate the proteins that are interacting with each other and uh, identify them by, by mass spec. So the main difference is I just want to uh, uh, emphasize here from traditional proteomics is that you don't need to uh, release your complex from the DNA. And that's the step actually in classical biochemistry where co protein complexes are the most um, you know, in danger because in order, in order for the proteins to be soluble to study them, you have to get them off the long polymer of DNA but at the same time, that treatment, detergent and salt, can break them apart so they're no longer interacting. So the key here is uh, with cross-linking, you can preserve the integrity prior to making that chromatin soluble by sonication. And um, then also, because it's very stable then, you can stringently wash it, for instance, with 6 molar urea. And then ultimately, in the same experiment, you can recover the proteins, the DNA, and the associated RNAs. So everything okay so far? You guys still out there? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay, perfect. good. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, so Jun, Hyuk Jun Kong in my lab decided to look for polycomb targeting factors in Drosophila. So um, we decided to enter this field, this very interesting field. And so he did this in Drosophila with Drosophila embryos. And um, this, my talk's gonna focus on one of the polycomb com complexes, PRC1. So we did study both um, main complexes, PRC1 and PRC2, but the um, surprising and interesting results um, that what we decided to focus most on was uh, PRC1. Um, again, so the, the tag we actually use is a protein A uh, and, and an endogenous bitinylation target sequence, uh, which is a very high affinity tag. And uh, again, we did BioTap XL with large amounts of embryos. And so this is what uh, we found. So this, this started us on this journey of uh, looking for kind of a different explanation for how polycomb is uh, targeted in uh, Drosophila cells. So what June found in essence was that PRC1 was interacting with co-activators rather than repressors in Drosophila embryos, that those were the strongest interactions. So if you look at what he found, if you color code the known PRC1 complexes, this is a table of the peptides recovered after a polycomb affinity purification after the cross-linking protocol. And um, so what you see is that these blue 
So the way we um, analyze these is we always look at the peptides recovered over the total input chromatin sample. So it's, it is like a chip experiment only with proteins. And that shows us the enrichment. And if you do that, then the interesting things come to the top of your list. Because of course, we also do uh, purify things like histones and general chromatin with this procedure. But the interesting uh, things come to the top of the list here. So this is the actual list, kind of not cherry picked. And so the blue subunits all were recovered, the known PRC1. But what was surprising was that uh, basically equal numbers as those were two uh, different um, co-activator complexes uh, or proteins, intracephal embryos. So um, that was the surprising result. Um, I should mention that Renato Paro had also found these uh, proteins in polycomb pulldowns much earlier, a number of years ago, but at lower amounts and probably because, um, but not noted them for sure, and because they didn't use cross-linking. So that again reinforces that this is uh, very likely a true result. So let me tell you a little bit about these complexes, so, or these proteins. BRD4 is a very, very famous protein in mammalian cancer biology. It's an acetylysine reader, it has these bromo domains, and it's known to be a co-activator, uh, uh, for instance, of the MYC oncoprotein. Um, so the two bromo, bromo domains that recognize acetylated lysines, it interacts with mediator and PTEFB. And um, interestingly for us, it has a trithorax phenotype when mutant in flies. So the fly name is actually female sterile one homeotic. And it gets that name because um, it's uh, maternally required for Hox gene expression. So the positive ac action on Hox genes opposing polycomb. Okay, so the MOZ complex, which will be the focus of most of my talk today is a conserved acetyl acetylation reader and writer. So the two Drosophila proteins that we found were ENOC and BR140 that you guys are probably quite familiar with. It's a very conserved complex, four member complex, um, uh, really mostly studied in mammals. And um, so I'm gonna use the mammalian name actually for its simplicity. So uh, the, the main component is the MOS histone acetyltransferase, which is a misdomain acetyltransferase adds acetylation uh, uh, to histones. Um, it also has an ING5 uh, member subunit, which has a PhD finger that recognizes this active mark, H3K4 trimethyl. It also has a bromo domain. Uh, this BR140 is, has a bromo domain uh, component, which is, again recognizes acetylated lysines. It also has a PWWP domain which recognizes H3K36 trimethyl, another active mark. So everything about this complex says it works with activation of transcription. And then very nicely, trithorax mutant phenotypes again, found in screens of zebrafish, mouse, and most recently in fly by the Tariq lab, um, just recently published last year. So very gratifying, but again, puzzling also. We use polycomb to pull down this complex yet it has the op opposing phenotype. So these uh, proteins with opposing phenotypes cross-linked together, um, but you may be wondering, is this interaction uh, between these actually real? Because we did use a, kind of a new method that is not uh, commonly used. So I already mentioned that Renato Paro had seen these, although uh, lower levels, but uh, quite distinctly um, in the past. And we also did uh, reciprocal pull down. So instead of pulling down polycomb, we asked, well, what if we tag this uh, BRPF subunit or BR140 in Drosophila? What do we pull down? And so this is just one example of that kind of experiment where uh, each dot is a protein that's uh, purified in affinity purification. And the comparison is between the polycomb pull down and BR140 pull down. So that if you look at the top 1% of pull downs for polycomb above this line, and the top 1% of pull downs of BR140 above that line, then what you have is in this quadrant, the common proteins that both of them pull down. And in that quadrant, in fact, what we find is proteins that are PRC1 or MOS complex. So in fact, it looks uh, quite, uh, it, it definitely, uh, the reciprocal pull down repeats the result that these two protein complexes interact. Now you might be thinking, well, this is also a tag that people don't typically use. So maybe this is a, uh, you know, a result of 
using that common tag. So in fact, what June had done, as I mentioned, he had also, in addition to studying PRC1, he also studied PRC2. So he studied the EZ subunit of PRC2, compared it to BR140. And when you do that, you find there isn't anything in common. And even though, if you looked at a chip, you might think they might be co-localized. Co-localization isn't enough to get cross-linking. The complexes have to be relatively quite close. Okay, so let's say this is real. Uh, if this is real, then why do these chromatin factors with opposite functions interact? So we can ask, well, where does this occur? And so, as I mentioned earlier with the BioTAP Excel method, you can get the proteins, um, but from the same prep, you could also get the DNA as a, as a normal chip. And so June did that. And so what I'm showing here is a heat map of all the polycomb that is found at transcription start sites. So, and um, it was clear that uh, this was a, a class of binding sites um, uh, that was quite prevalent. About 2000 genes are bound at the transcription start site. And so this is all of the polycomb sites. And then looked and asked, well, uh, is MOS there, or BR140? And in fact, it looks like it's at all of these sites. So uh, for those of you uh, not used to looking at these heat maps, basically it shows the concentration of the factor and each row is an, a, a different gene. So um, now this, all the polycomb sites, BR140 actually has many more sites that don't have polycomb. So it is more broadly found, or more broadly found in the genome. But what are these genes? So if we look at the uh, geo terms of uh, the bound genes, we have genes that were only bound by BR140, the co-bound genes, and polycomb only. And if, look, if you look at the co-bound genes, you can see they're very strongly skewed to development and morphogenesis, whereas the um, BR140 only, the active genes, are the general cellular functions. So I, we concluded from this that PRC1 and MOS co-occupy the developmental promoters. So remember, these are found by cross-linking um, within, uh, you know, uh, live cells. And so, uh, in fact, the cross-linking helps us uh, establish that the proteins are actually together and not, at, uh, not mapped, say, because they're, uh, some cells have one and some cells have the other. So we're fairly confident about this uh, co-occupation. So next, we'd like to know, well, what's the status of those genes? So we looked at what chromatin marks are found in those co-bound genes. And what we found was that they really, um, segregated into two clusters. So if we look at the active mark, H3K4 trimethyl, those genes um, all have it at their five prime ends. But if we look at the polycomb mark, the silencing mark, H3K27 trimethyl, it was a cluster of genes that had a lot of it, and then a cluster of genes that didn't have it at the TSS or didn't have it at all. And so I just wanna focus on this first cluster because they were really interesting to us because they, they had both the active mark and the silent mark. And so um, uh, based on what we know about mammalian work, we thought, well, this might be a parallel with bivalency in mammalian development. Bivalency being the coexistence of active and silent marks in a kind of poised state. So let me just go through that right now. The bivalency model, which came out of Brad Bernstein and others, uh, colleagues, in the field uh, was, uh, again, based on the idea that um, up until that point, people really thought, OK, genes are either active with active mark, silent with a silent mark. And that's what you see in most genes, in most cells. But when you look at pluripotent cells, ES cell lines, in fact, there's a, a very large group of genes that have both of these marks coincident. Um, and yet, when you take those cells, which can grow in a dish, but you differentiate them in vitro, you find that in fact, then they become specified so that either they um, have more uh, active mark or more silent mark as they go towards a differentiated state. And in fact, uh, in the same process, as they become different, more differentiated, they start having the cell type specific patterns of polycomb and the cell type specific transcription patterns, right? So um, we wondered whether this might be the same in Drosophila um, and then if so, is it possible that that trithorax polycomb group interaction might form a bivalent 
protein complex on these bivalent genes. So um, what we did know was that the, these complexes we, we were studying actually had the capacity to recognize bivalent marks. Um, that is the ING5 subunit of the MOZ complex has a PhD figure, finger that's known to bind H3K4 trimethyl. And um, the P polycomb, of course, has, been, has famously been known to bind the, poly the polycomb group mark laid down by the EZ protein H3K27 through its chromodomain. Um, and that binds the silent mark. So in fact, if you put these proteins together, they could bind the two marks that are characteristic of bivalent chromatin. Um, so maybe this is a bivalent complex. Okay, is everyone still out there? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so uh, then I, we wanted to, so going back to this though, so I told you about this cluster one that's focused on um, these bivalent promoters, but of course we had a whole nother group of genes. So uh, what was going on with those genes? So in fact, um, uh, what we could see is that rather than having this uh, silent mark of polycomb, they were more enriched for an active mark at that same locus, at the same uh, site in H3, K27 acetylation. So they were more concentrated on that. And uh, we didn't have a great antibody for this, but uh, we could see that uh, the Drosophila BRD4 was actually more prevalent in that group than in the other cluster. So these definitely look like active prom promoters. They have all the active marks. So what we think from this is that BRD4 may be required for that transition from bivalency initially to the active state uh, during development. So I do have to mention here that this co-localization in embryos is a very tricky um, discussion because of course, as I mentioned earlier, the cross-linking strongly supports the proteins being together. They're caught together, can be cross-linked together. But when we start looking at chromatin marks, we can't say that they're actually coincident from these experiments. It's inconclusive. And that's because of course the embryo is a whole group of cells. And in fact, also, you know, there are two alleles in, in every cell. Um, but what we did know was that the way the clusters, the way the, way the marks clustered, um, it looked like more like an all or none at these developmental genes. So it did suggest that there was bivalency rather than a mixed cell or allelic population, because we would have expected if it was simply a mixture of cells, some with active, some with silent, that it would be a gradation. And I'm going to try to explain that here in just a few screenshots. So if you look at typical genes from these clusters, at their actual profiles from uh, screenshots, what you see is that they all bound polycomb here in blue. They all bound BR140, the MOZ subunit here in green. And they all had the H3K4 active mark here in red. But for the rest of the marks, what we found was um, that if you looked at the polycomb mark, H3K27 trimethyl, that in this cluster one, it was very strong, whereas the active marks were not at all. Whereas if you looked at the active marks, oh, so that suggested these might truly be bivalent promoters. Whereas if you looked at the active marks, now they were strong over these genes and the polycomb mark was basically not there, suggesting that they were truly active promoters. So it looks like we truly had these two kinds of groups of proteins or genes bound by polycomb in embryos. And so how might these observations relate to Poly, the ideas about poly, polycomb targeting. So if I go back to the classical model, um, which was that we would have recruitment of polycomb or trithorax depending on the situation. So active, active or repressed, then recruitment. So we really didn't find evidence for this. That is, we had thought we would have find repressors that uh, targeted polycomb, but in fact, we were finding more activators with PRC1. And furthermore, so we hadn't, uh, you know, it's, it's still open to debate, but we really didn't find evidence for this complicated scenario of distinct protein-protein interactions in each gene. You could argue that would be very difficult to see if, if that is indeed the case. But based on our results, we thought of a different model. And that's what we've been 
um, thinking about ever since, which is what if really these um, bivalent complexes exist in embryos and by default are at all the developmental promoters initially. And that what, what if um, instead of being recruited there, they don't have to be recruited, they're there by default, that when activators come or repressors come, then they resolve activators promoting the uh, interaction of co-activators and building complexes based on that and repressors promoting more polycomb, increase of polycomb mark. And so the idea is that um, activators or repressors that the, this bivalent complex would be responsive to these activators and repressors and these would resolve as development goes into the appropriate patterns. Well, that's nice, but then it begs the question, well, how would this resolution be triggered? Um, it still kind of sounds like magic. So here we get into real speculation. We've been speculating that um, it's acetylation that must drive the resolution of these bivalent complexes. And part of that is simply that I, of course, the, the knowledge of the field that acetylation drives gene activation, and also just the identity of these complexes, the subunit components. That is, on this side, the coactivator side, it's filled with readers and writers of histone acetylation. There's an acetyltransferase, the ENOC or MOS. There are at least two bromodomain containing proteins. And then if you look at the other side of the equation, Polycomb is known to be repelled by histone acetylation by many, many studies in, in the literature. And in addition, um, H3K27 acetyl, of course, would, that position is competitive with H3K27 trimethyl. So they're mutually exclusive. You have to be one or, or the other. So, um, so we're thinking that acetylation might explain how transcription factors actually resolve uh, these uh, bivalency into active or silent. So back to the model then, the bivalent master switch model then would say that the bivalent complex is waiting for something to happen. Transcription factors come and transcription factors are known to be dependent on co-activators predominantly in development, P300 and CVP, the histone acetyl trans transferases. At the same time, Histone deacetylases are either constitutive, they're quite abundant, or they could be attracted by repressors. So there's this antagonism between activators and repressors at each locus. And whichever one wins then ends up um, either favoring having co-activators take over for that gene or uh, PR, more reinforcing PRC1, PRC2, maybe spreading and making a more silent domain that's uh, not conducive to transcription. So that's the model. And we think it can explain a number of things in the literature, particularly why PRC1 is observed on active genes, which is actually was found as way back in 2006, when um, the Mueller, uh, Jörg Mueller's lab first looked to see in imaginal disks at the UBX locus, uh, they could see that polycomb was sitting there by chip when it was silent, but then also in the disks where it was active, polycomb was still sitting there. So it wasn't simply the occupancy, it was something else that was regulating whether uh, polycomb was repressing or not. And since then, people have set, found by chip experiments, lots of evidence of PRC1 on active genes, unexplained. Um, also, we like it because it suggests that regulatory elements may never be unoccupied, allowing the reversibility of cell type changes. So you can imagine you've resolved into this state but if activators go away, um, then it, it's possible if you're through development that you change into a different cell type. Now that's kind of counter to e traditional epigenetics, but as I mentioned, um, in true epigenetics, perhaps this PRC1, PRC2 spreads, becomes irreversible and then refractory to ever switching back. So that's an, another thing to think about, but um, in general, for most of the genes, they are still switchable and it would make it an easier problem if regulatory elements were always just kind of handed off from factor to factor. And then finally, what we like is the idea that acetylation activity rather than protein interactions would drive the resolution of bivalency because this is a more general property and doesn't require a lot of specific combinatorial uh, protein-protein interactions. 
So let's see, are these conserved in mammals? Um, so we've only basically dabbled in this. We, we wish we had some evidence for this. Basically, we looked at human ES cell lines and found that indeed a polycomb subunit, a MOS subunit, active and silent marks are coincident at bivalent and many bivalent genes. And they look like this. So they look really like, you know, true bivalency, positive and negative marks. However, we don't have any proteomic evidence yet. And so there could be sort of two very um, broad uh, reasons for this. Um, one is that maybe it's not like protein-protein interactions in mammalian cells that run the bivalent complex, but it's truly just a competition for the same binding sites, same factors. So that's one thing, competition versus actually being physically linked. The other possibility is we just simply picked the wrong subunits to study. And we've focused a lot on the CBX subunits because of their relationship to polycom, which we studied in Drosophila. But in fact, it looks like the variant PRC1 that doesn't have CBX is probably the more interesting at this point. So we're revisiting that at this moment. Um, but I will point out that um, the similarity of our model to the responsive model of uh, Rob Close, um, in mammalian cells, which is instead of recruitment, he pointed out a number of years ago now that a responsive model could uh, be, uh, could explain the uh, cell type specificity if there was a kind of default competition between polycomb and trithorax at CP, CPG rich promoters of mammalian cells. So there was always a competition that could be won based on whether there was more transcription or less transcription. So quite a, quite a similar model. So fundamental questions remain. I've suggested that pluripotent cells might form bivalence complexes on each developmental gene, and that then these master switches might be flipped independently in response to local transcription factors at each gene. But then you can ask, well, how did this start in the first place? And really interestingly, in fact, the developmental genes are, have been shown to be pre-marked with H3K4, trimethyl and K27 trimethyl in germ cells, both sperm and eggs from Brad Cairns and, and many others now in the field. So it raises the interesting possibility that genes might always be marked, which would be true epigenetics. Okay, so um, I wanna just end with just a few comments about cancer, the relevance to cancer. And um, so, um, it's known that aberrant acetylation is caused by some chromatin fusion proteins that drive certain kinds of cancer. And in fact, the two factors I've talked about here, BRD4 and MOS, are both fit into the, both fit into this category. That is, BRD4 can be fused. So the fusions occur through chromosome translocations, breakage and joining, inappropriate joining, where now you express a fusion protein. And these have been found to be recurrent in many cancers. And when they're recurrent, you can ask, okay, so what does the combination of these chromatin proteins do that the individuals don't? And it's classically misregulation. So BRD4 is um, recurrently fused to nut protein in a disease called nut midline carcinoma. And MOS is recurrently fused to a protein called TIF2 in acute myeloid leukemia. So I just have a few more slides just to talk about this, but the a uh, predicted consequence of these fusions is related to what we were talking about normal development, but in this case that the direct rec recruitment of these coactivators would bypass the need for the transcription factors, and that might be how transcription gets met, uh, pro patterns get messed up and leading to cancer. So just a couple of slides on BRD4 nut, which we did this work with Dr. Chris French, who's at Brigham and Women's Hospital and is the discoverer of this um, disease. So um, as I told you, BRD4 has bromodomains that bind acetylated histones. The nut protein is, actually has an activation domain that binds very tightly to P300. And of course, P300 is a histone acetyltransferase. So what it looks like in this case is that there's a feed forward loop of acetylation of histones, binding of those acetylated histones, then more acetylation, then more binding. In fact, a sort of a walking that has um, now has a strong broadening effect on enhancers. So my whole talk, I've been talking about genes, but it turns, you know, the gene transcription start sites, but um, it turns out that this BRD4 nut protein at least has its 
effect on regulatory, large regulatory regions. And what it does is it fills them with uh, extremely broad and continuous regions of hyperacetylated chromatin. And this leads to vast uh, misregulation in, in the cancer cells. So if you look at a, a chip profile for NUT or BRD4 or P300 in these uh, fusions, they all are coincident, really broad binding, much broader than you would ever find in a normal cell, very broad acetylation, exclusion of the polycomb mark. And so this is just an example in the large regulatory region of the MYC protein. Um, but anyway, this leads to quite deranged transcription programs and um, you know, uh, inappropriate uh, growth in this quite terrible squamous, squamous cell uh, cancer. Um, and in fact, these uh, what we call megadomains can even be seen within the nucleus as these very, very large speckles, which is one diagnostic uh, of this disease. So lastly, then mos 2 we really just started working on this with uh, Dr. Scott Armstrong at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, not too long ago, and um, what we know so far again, histone acetyltransferase, it's now fused to a co-activator that binds CBP. CBP very similar to P300 is a histone acetyltransferase. And so in this case, we think, well, maybe transcription factors may be bypassed by this, so they're no longer needed for increased acetylation and activation. Now you've got this acetyltransferase fused basically to this acetyltransferase. And in addition, very interestingly, it's possible that there's a combination of distinct site specificities that may also be very important. So maybe these sites aren't sufficient for transcriptional activation, but you always need to add the specificity of CBP or P300. And so these are the things we're looking into right now. So I'm gonna just close with, again, the model, default binding to activators, oh, sorry, to, um, to transcription start sites of these uh, possible bivalent complexes, waiting to see whether activators win at that site or repressors win, and then acting accordingly to uh, uh, resolve into these active or silent states. And we like it because regulatory elements may never be completely unoccupied, allowing reversibility, and that acetylation activity rather than protein interactions may drive this resolution. So with that, uh, just acknowledge, here's our, our Zoom lab photo. And I've really uh, focused almost entirely on the work of Hyuk Jun Kong, who's an instructor in my lab, a very valued member of the group. I also talked about Ann Smolko's work. Art Alexienko is a former member. He's now at Constellation Pharmaceuticals and he invented the Biotap um, method. Then our collaborators on BRD4 NUT and MOZ TIF2. And if you wanna know more about those models, there's our model and Rob Close's model, there's the, the references. So thank you very much. And I hope you're still there and I'd be happy to take questions. We all are very much there. Thank you very <laughs> much for a wonderful talk. I thank loved you. it. So questions, let's start with the, so we had Detlef Weigel in, in the past and he said, Tarek, I would not start asking question unless a grad student asks. And I like that idea. Oh, that's nice, yeah. <laughs> so questions, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Dr. Kuroda, for a very nice talk. I have a question. So um, by looking at the uh, bivalent model that you showed right now, to me, this seems that PRC1 alone is not uh, sufficient to contribute enough to the silent state of gene expression. Um, because by the model that you showed, when bivariant C shifts to either the active or the silent state of genes, uh, the PRC1 stays there with both the co-activators and PRC2, which sort of intrigues me that PRC1 may not be uh, a strong complex to either uh, give a silent state of gene expression. So uh, I was a bit confused about this because, because we know that PRC1 um, cause silencing of the genes. And uh, so if you can please ask this question and tell me about it. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great question. So we don't know what PRC1 is doing at say in the bivalent state. So maybe it's simply a marker, a place where 
PRC2 can join and reinforce and make, you know, and kick off the co-activators and then it becomes a strong repressor. Um, another possibility is that it is a balance even there and the bivalency, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's um, antagonized by the co-activators. So they're just pushing against each other in the activities. Um, and then of course, the real, the real key, which we wish we could look at is perhaps the PRC1 on active genes is actually modified in a different way than when it's sitting in repressed genes. So it's not only histones that can have post-translational modifications. So there could be a number of things happening on the low side that are silent that aren't, is, aren't happening in the low side that are active, the same complex. And with biochemistry, we can't study that because whenever we study, we study many cells, obviously, but even if we could sell, study one cell within one cell, there would be a mixture of PRC1 sitting on active and silent. So if they're biochemically different, it'd be very hard to tell. I think in the future, these are the kinds of questions that people are gonna ask when they have the methods to do it. Yeah, and also uh, with this technique of uh, BioTap XL, you cross-link the complexes, uh, which intrigues me to ask that uh, this will also capture the ones which only bind instantaneously uh, with each other rather than a strong connection with each other. It, it should capture anything that's happening at the moment or say the 10 minutes. Well, yeah. maybe only the moment because it may kill the cells, but um, at, at which you apply the, uh, when the formaldehyde goes into the cell. Yeah. Um, but I think if something's stable, it's certainly going to capture it. If something's transient, it's going to capture some, you know, some group, a, pot, a fraction of that. Thank you. Thank you for answering. And I should mention another thing nice about formaldehyde is just that then you kill all the proteases and you have everything. You also don't have to worry about the proteolysis that would occur in a normal purification. Yes, yes, that is true. Thank you. Yeah, the other questions? So um, I, I'll ask one question from my side, then others are. So I am actually quite blown away that uh, the mystery of development gets more complex with every uh, attempt to un more understand that. And so, uh, so one question is generally that do you envision that um, so bivalent polycom complex that you propose. So do you ever envision that there might be a possibility of a bivalent trithorax complex working in almost or similarly as this uh, bivalent complex of the polycom? So um, I guess I should ask you, is the question whether there will be other complexes like this along the way towards more activation or more repression? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I, I love that question because that's exactly what I'm thinking. And actually, when you mentioned more complexity, uh, I think one could accuse me of being a reductionist. I mean, here I'm trying to reduce it rather than, you know, people always say it's so complicated, it's unbelievably complicated. I'm trying to actually reduce it to very simple principles. But um, so I think the principle I'm thinking of, and I think maybe you are too, is that of chemistry where you have the forward and backward reaction. And that if you go, Say if you, and we have some evidence for this, that if you, okay, if you look at the, if you purify PRC1, you get BR140, which is a member of MAS. Um, if you purify BR140, you also get polycomb, but you also get ASH1, which if you purify polycomb, you don't get ASH1. So in a way, you may be stepping towards the next step towards activation, which is you're kicking out more polycomb and you're requiring ASH1, which is another trithorax protein. So if, I don't know if that is what you were thinking, but that's the way I'm thinking is it's backwards, forwards, everything in biology is uh, these oppositional forces okay. or competition. Thank you. Dilla, I had a question. Yeah, go on. So thank you for the wonderful talk, uh, Professor. It's on. It's an honor to listen to you after having read all of your papers. So I was just wondering if um, maybe if you're just looking at one universal switch for, so like you said, that acetylation might be the switch that's pushing PRC1 
to the positivity side, can't it be that it's um, actually a combination or a wide variety of uh, marks that might be influencing that? For example, phosphorylation of histones or ubiquitination, and that there might be specific switches for, let's say, specific either time points or cell types. Um, yes, you know, that's, that's a great point. Um, I focused on acetylation, but we know that all those other things can happen. And again, it kind of comes back to what can we, can, what can we study by mass spec or what, you know, at what point do you decide um, you find some trace of something that you make an antibody specific to it, maybe you can start teasing out whether there's, you know, phospho something sitting here and not sitting on the uh, genes that are in a different state. Um, but yes, definitely. Um, all these combinations, all these marks have evolved for a reason. Yes, thank you. G. Abdullah, may I go ahead with question? Yes, sir. So uh, a wonderful talk, uh, not only that we have tissue specific complexes, rather I would say locus specific complexes yeah. as well. Uh, something you were, uh, referring to Renato's, uh, you know, struggle, but that PhD student, she couldn't purify these things. You have done a wonderful job. Uh, so I was wondering if, um, if you have proteins, which are bio tap tag, if you have, if it is possible to look at the post translational modifications of these complexes, these bivalent complexes to see what is the state of PRC1 complex in one state versus another, in one locus versus another locus? Yes, so a lot of people are interested in, you know, pulling down single, the single gene or whatever, or a locus and looking at proteins. And I think we're not there yet in terms of mass spec. I think it's, if you do a, just a calculation, I mean, we're using massive amounts of embryos or cells to do the work we do. Um, but things are getting better all the time and mass spec uh, technology has just gotten better, you know, is always getting better all the time. Um, but one way that we could in theory do it, and we just really don't have, a, as you know, a big operation or, you know, uh, anyway, but is that you could say, okay, we know that polycomb is interesting to us and its interaction with Moz is interesting. So now instead of the biotap tag where the two tags are on the one protein, you put them on two separate proteins. So if you put the protein A on polycomb and the uh, biotinylation on MOS, then you can purify just the complex that has those two things together and not the complex when PRC1 is with PRC2 and in this very long repressive state. So that's one way you could start teasing out is there a post-translational modification in that state that's not in the other state? And uh, we would like to do that, but um, we, sh we shall see whether we get there. Mm -hmm. Recently, there was a, another manuscript about uh, Enoch and uh, it talked about, uh, you know, acetylation independent role of Enoch in, in gene activation. I wonder if you have seen that and um, it, Is it recently- it uh, what journal or what? I forgot the name of the author and the, so it it talked about, it was after our, our manuscript and it talked about Enoch independent role of, uh, uh, sorry, histone acetylation independent role of Enoch. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll look for that. I know that Jerry Workman has worked and Jerry, well, Jerry, former postdoc, uh, Fu Huang, I think in Taiwan is working on it. Yeah. And, uh, she was pursuing some of the DNA replication function. Mm -hmm. It might have been her, um, but yeah, I'll look for that because um, I, I haven't seen that. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah. Another question I have is about PRC1. When you find it uh, in, in one of your experiments, you find it, you know, uh, on loci, which are trimethylated at lysine 27. And then there were other where it is still there with this uh, coactivators, but uh, with K27 acetylation, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So how do we explain this? Because you know, this uh, dogma in the field that PRC1 goes where lysine 27 trimethylation is, and it's something which 
will be repelled by K27 acetylation. But you very nicely show on many loci this correlation. So, so I think in this in this case, um, the mammalian work has been leading the Drosophila work. So there's the classical model where PRC2 has to come first and then PRC1 with the chroma domain recognizing the mark. But in mammalian cells, I think they've really, and, and organisms, I think they've really shown that variant PRC1 is very likely to come first early with the ubiquitin mark. And that PRC2, one flavor of it, recognizes the ubiquitin mark. And then the canonical PRC1 can maybe compact chromatin by the, with the chromodomain binding mark. And so, so um, I think there's a lot of evidence for that. And I think that's also the case in Drosophila. I think all of those steps also occur in Drosophila. And um, we are starting to try to do a little bit of work of variant PRC1. And we've already found um, some new parallels with, I mean, not with parallels with mammalian work. So um, I think that, um, and Yuri Schwartz, who's a Drosophila person yeah, in yeah. Sweden, he's also found that PRC1 does not require PRC2 to be localized. He's done some really nice work in that area. So I think the classical, the initial work, uh, the initial model was great, but it hasn't held up. And there's definitely um, two ways to go there. You can start with PRC1 or you can start with PRC2, maybe. I would argue almost everything starts with PRC1. Are there other questions? So I think Mujahid has a question. He has his hand up. Go ahead, Mujahid. Mujahid, go ahead. Mujahid, uh, we can't hear you. I think you are muted or? No, we still can't hear you. you can, can you type your question in the chat? Yeah. You can type your question in the chat. Why you type? Dr. Dober yeah. has Go ahead. Question. Abdullah, who is having another question? So while Mujahid types. Dr. Ramzal has a question. G. Go ahead, Dr. Ramzal. Afzal, you are mute. I think Afzal is also not listening. Okay, I can go ahead. So uh, while Mujahid is writing, so I, I kind of uh, always thought that, uh, and uh, I favor a model in which you know will because these complexes are very dynamic, uh, and your work is highlighting how how dynamic they are. They are not only, you know, in different tissues, but on different loci, they will be different. So do you think they, we will meet one day, this epigenetics of PRC1, PRC2 will meet uh, signaling? Like there's a huge void mm. in MAP kinase signaling or whatever. And then all of a sudden we fall in the nucleus and we start having our own models. So, you know, that's out of my expertise, but, um... Aren't there always transcription factors impinged by the signaling? And so it would be the transcription factors. Or I know there have been reports, though, of kinases coming directly onto loci, et cetera. So I would be interested in your view on that. I, I, I think that the, the resolution in different kinds of tissue, specific uh, complexes, and uh, all these things will take place. My feeling is we'll find that Polycom complexes on actively transcribed genes are differently modified post-translationally as compared to uh, silent loci, where we find you know, uh, clear silent, no transcript is there. Uh, so there, I believe the complexes will be differently post-translationally modified, whether it is phosphorylation, whether it is acetylation, I was thinking maybe ENOC is, ENOC or other acetyl, acetyl transferases like FSH1, uh, in addition to working together with the acetylated histones, they may be modifying the uh, chromatin bound proteins as well, these yeah. PRC complexes. I would, I would agree with that. 
That's what I think. Let's see. I on the chat, someone says I cannot hear anyone. Do others? Mujahid, uh, are you writing your question? No, um, I can oh. speak. Oh yeah, oh. he is there. Wow, good Hello. to see you. <laughs> it's a great talk. Thank you very much. A lot of information. Um, I was wondering, uh, you have shown the bivalent state at some point. Uh, can I ask uh, at which embryonic state do you have shown the bivalent state? So um, we actually haven't taken very small time points or anything. So these are mid to late embryos. So 12 to 24 hours. Yeah. And so it would be much more interesting to go earlier actually. And we've been sort of um, again, feeling like we don't have enough resources to do good experiments with small amount, you know, we need to make more material. Um, now with uh, cut and run, you can use a lot fewer embryos, et cetera. So we want to go earlier and look earlier, but it's surprising that that late, even though genes now are, you know, being expressed in pattern specific ways and stuff that the bivalency still persists. Um, Actually, we spoke to Welcome Bender about this, and he said, "Here's some genes that definitely have already, you know, been established as on or off. So you should get this. They shouldn't be bivalent, but they still look bivalent, um, with all the caveats. In larval, in larvae, as I mentioned, the imaginal discs, you know, Jurg, Jurg Mueller found years ago that still the genes look like they are still reversible. Maybe they still have both." factors sitting. So it may be much more persistent than people realize. Uh, so the other question is, uh, do you think like bivalent state can be uh, exist in, in different developmental stages and uh, in adult tissues as well? Yes, that, uh, that's actually been seen in mammalian, uh, the work of, um, let's see, Ramesh uh, Shiv Dazani. He's published some pretty high profile papers showing that um, in like say gut development and mammals and such that different genes become bivalent, like you can acquire bivalency. And what I would think is that in a way that's just showing reversibility. As you go from one stage to another, you have to switch certain genes. So he's shown that the bivalent uh, genes are the most sensitive to EZH2 knockout and that they're different genes in different tissues. Yeah, because uh, I have seen this, um, I have uh, done the bivalency from early embryonic stages too, and different, like a different time point, like from a 30 minute to uh, at a four hour, and then in a head testis and ovary. Uh, but the weird pattern is like uh, bivalency stay in the early embryonic stage, like in stage two. And then I didn't see bivalency uh, like uh, in stage nine and 12. And then again in larval head and testes again, there is a strong bivalent state, but uh, I'm not sure if it's, um, if it's due to like uh, uh, only a chip experiment can confirm that or it's just, you know, uh, only chip data is showing like uh, overlap of uh, K4 ME3 or K27 ME3. Yeah, I, I know it's really a hard a hard thing in, in flies to do to make the argument because there's always heterogeneity of cells, and I guess. And but I think you could think of bivalency though in terms of um, it's all about detection. So if it's very strong bivalency, like in mammalian ES cells, it's kind of, it's totally obvious they couldn't ignore it. But if at, in a, a cell, um, you know, most most the genes are become active, then there's less silent mark or the other way around. It's always about the threshold. Can you still detect the other mark? Is it still there, but below detection and, but still represents reversibility. You can reverse using that mark, even though you can't detect it. So, but I think, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you're doing experiments on early, early development, but it is hard to make the argument that you're seeing, you know, yeah. something happening in the same cell. Sorry, the last question. I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. Um, have you ever checked uh, this bivalent state along with the high C data if uh, there are, for example, uh, bivalent uh, TADs as well, like uh, the TAD existed in both chromatin state with K4 ME3 or uh, K27 ME3 as well? Um, no, I haven't even, I haven't thought of doing that. That's an interesting um, question. Um, 
One question I get sometimes is, you know, in terms of, well, it's that's too complicated actually. I, I, but yeah, I think that, um, I think that's an interesting possibility. I think people have found that genes within TADS can be co-regulated. Mm -hmm. um, I, after I found out that TADS were sort of mainly conserved, I've sort of just kept them in mind as compartments that can be co-regulated, but I haven't looked at that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Anna. Jahid, where are you? You are uh, China? Or? In Vienna. You're in Vienna. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, uh, let's see, you have another. I... Yeah. Go ahead, Afza. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Corona. It's uh, really, I felt very simple to understand, you know, very difficult topic because I am kind of outsider in this PRC1, PRC2. But thanks for making it <laughs> very simple to people like us. Uh, actually, talking about this bivalency, uh, I was really struck when you showed this proteomic data where you, you showed that, uh, you know, uh, trithorax component, they interact with PRC1, but there was none interaction with PRC2. So I was wondering, I mean, these PRC1 and 2, do they not interact? Because, you know, uh, so much familiar with the, with the biology of these. Yeah, that, so that's a great question. So first of all, with the formaldehyde cross-linking, it's a very a short crosslinker. And so you seem to be getting the, the nearest neighbors and then you know the probability of getting something farther away, it's not very efficient. So you don't get things maybe farther away or more indirect so much. Um, but yes, PRC1 and PRC2 are co-localized on chromatin in you know everyone's uh, studies, chip studies all the time, but there's very little uh, interaction in the sense of this cross-linking assay. So I think that that tells us, um, for first of all, just what I just told you that it's kind of nearest neighbor and not just kind of non-specific neighborhood. Um, uh, but there are, there were some. We did find some shared components, um, and so they may be bridging between those. Great question. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. Are there other questions? So if there are no more questions, uh, let us thank then Professor Karoda. Thank you very much for uh, being with us. It was a real pleasure. Uh, yes, thank you wrote, so much. Uh, uh, we hope we'll stay in touch with you and we'll uh, bother you more than often. That would be great because we have a very small community really. So yeah, yeah. we should be in touch. Thank you. Yeah. yeah we wish thank you a you good day there. Bye-bye. It was fun visiting. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.